Welcome to Fox TV News, where everything is true. Three wards at Trelawney Child Care Facility reported missing. The police have issued an Ananda alert for three wards at the Granville Child Care Facility in Trelawney, who have been missing since Friday. There are Tishana Kerr, Rakaya Duncan, and Onika Bryan, all age 15. Tishana is of dark complexion, slim built, and is about 5 feet 4 inches tall. Rakaya is of brown complexion, slim build, and is about 4 feet 8 inches tall. And Onika is of dark complexion, medium build, and about 5 feet 4 inches tall. Reports from the Falmouth Police are that the three girls were last seen at the facility about 8.30 p.m. and left for St. James. At the time they went missing, Tishana was dressed in a red blouse and brown shorts, Wakaya was dressed in a red t-shirt and blue shorts, and Onika was dressed in a red t-shirt and red shorts. Anyone knowing the whereabouts of Tishana Kerr, Wakaya Duncan, and Onika Bryan is being asked to contact the Falmouth Police at 876-954-3222, Police 119 emergency number or the nearest police station. Killer of UWI lecturer in 2007, given some consideration. A man who was convicted of the 2007 murder of University of the West Indies UWI lecturer, Dr. Peter Vogel, was on Friday ordered to 10 years in prison before being eligible for parole consideration. The convict, Kelvin Dono, successfully appealed his September 2017 sentence, which ordered that he should be imprisoned for 25 years with a stipulation that he served a minimum of 10 years before being eligible for parole consideration. Vogel 60 was found dead at his home in College Common, St. Andrew on July 19, 2007. A forensics pathologist gave evidence at the trial, at which Downer's girlfriend, Yannick Scott, was also tried and convicted that Vogel's cause of death was asphyxia second to smuggling and strangulation. The Court of Appeal agreed with Downer that the sentencing judge did not weigh the fact that he Donna spent nine years in custody awaiting trial. After affirming that 25 years of imprisonment, the appeal court ordered that the stipulation that the appellant Donna served 15 years before becoming paroled is set aside. In arising at the 10 year before the convict becomes eligible for parole consideration, the court said it credited him five out of nine years he spent in pretrial custody. The sentence is reckoned to have started on September 29, 2017, ordered the Court of Appeal. This means that Donna will leave prison in 2027 if he qualifies for or is granted parole. Scott did not appeal her 25-year sentence with a similar stipulation that she served 15 years before being eligible for parole consideration. Evidence was given at the trial in the Home Circuit Court in 2017 that Virgil's body was found with the hands and feet bound and a piece of cloth tied around his mouth. The lecturer's motor car and several household items were discovered to be missing from the home at the time of the murder. In court, Scott and Donna both denied involvement in the killing. Scott testified that she and Donna was at Virgil's home when gunmen entered the house. She said the intruders removed items from the home and packed them to Virgil's car before ordering Donna to drive the vehicle. Both accused acknowledged that no report was made to the police shortly thereafter, claiming that they did not do so because they were afraid. However, the Count's case, as put forward by the Court of Appeal, suggested instead that Scott, who was Virgil's helper, had become fired by his wife in mid-July 2007 after their working relationship deteriorated. Scott was, however, allowed to stay at the house with her baby until Virgil's wife returned from the Cayman Islands. On July 18, 2007, between the hours of 9 p.m. and 9.30 p.m., Virgil, a Swift national, talked to his three children, aged 6, 8, and 10, in bed in the presence of Scott. The children later found their father dead about 1 a.m. the next day, while Scott and her young baby were nowhere to be found. Neither Scott nor Donna contacted Virgil's family or the police after 18 July 2007. They moved from their usual place of abode and Miss Scott stole the identity of another person, which she utilized up to the time of her arrest, stated the 12-page Court of Appeal judgment. Donna was apprehended on November 13, 2008, and later charged, while Scott was arrested on May 12, 2012. 
Volkold worked in the Department of Life Science at the University of the West Indies and was one of the leading researchers on rare animals in Jamaica at the time of his death. Search on for suspect suspects who stole Wi-Fi access point in West Rural St. Andrew. The police are searching for a criminal or criminals who made off with an access point from a free Wi-Fi facility that was scheduled to be launched last week in the Stonehill area of the West Rural St. Andrew constituency. Speaking at Thursday's launch of another access point in Golden Spring, also in West Rural St. Andrew, Chief Executive Officer of the Universal Service Fund, USF, Daniel Dawes, brought the culprits or culprits who made off with the equipment. He also called on police to conduct a thorough investigation in a bid to arrest those responsible. Somebody without any conscience went and stole one of the access points. We have been rolling out these things throughout Jamaica, starting all the way from Seaford Town in St. Thomas, all the way into Westmoreland, and we have never had one case of anybody taking what is not theirs, said a furious Dawes. We must make an example of that individual or those persons. It ought not to happen, he declared. The USF's Community Connect Wi-Fi Portal project aims to erect 189 Wi-Fi hotspots across communities locally. Three communities in each of the 63 constituencies are to have the access points the USF previously stated. According to Dawes, $7.5 million was spent to outfit the West Rural St. Andrew constituency to be able to provide the Wi-Fi services. This is not a joke business. This is not mango and oranges. This is a tool to provide enhancement and enrichment to the lives of our Jamaican people, asserted Dawes. He pleaded with residents to give information on the culprits to a police or member of parliament for West Rural St. Andrew, Juliet Cuthbert Flynn. A similar call for information was also made by Corporal Gregory Bennett, head of the Stony Hill Police. For Cuthbert Flynn, the theft of the access point was heartbreaking. Whoever took it, bring it back. Leave it somewhere that we will know, pleaded the parliamentarian on Thursday. These things are also very expensive and is for the good of the community for development, she further lamented. Juveniles not being taught as teachers shun correctional facilities due to low pay. The continued education of juveniles in correctional facilities is being severely hampered by the shortage of teachers. Of 48 teaching posts, 30 are vacant. These shortcomings problems were highlighted in the juvenile services report from the DCS, which was recently tabled in Parliament. Programs delivered by the DCS include academic, vocational, and life skills. The academic program is administered by civil and staff trained and certified at the Bachelor's of Science level. There is a high attrition rate among teachers and vacant positions remain unfilled for long periods. It is difficult to recruit teachers due to disparity in salary and benefits between the DCS and public schools. Salary and allowances are paid at the diploma level, although teachers have first degrees. Teachers in public schools benefit from midterm breaks, Christmas, Easter, and long summer holidays, the report stated. It said there is no established structure to facilitate upward mobility of teachers and teachers in the DCS do not benefit from the Ministry of Education and Youth, training development programs, workshops, and seminars. There is limited or no supervision to ensure that lesson plans, timetables, and maintenance of attendance registers are done in accordance with the standards of the Ministry of Education and Youth, and the MOEY does not provide oversight of the system in the DCS, it stated. Despite the challenges over the last five years, an average of 15 children shot the CSEC, obtaining 50% passes in one to four subjects, the report added. It said the main challenge was the vocational offering is that the hard choice NSTA certification for the various workshops is not forthcoming due to resource constraints and difficult meeting some requirements. This has resulted in the closure of some workshops and the instructors who deliver the training are demotivated. It has been recommended that the MOEY assumes full responsibility for delivering the education program in the juvenile correctional facilities. It should recruit and remunerate the teachers, including specialist teachers. This will resolve the issue relating to pay and benefits and will present the opportunity for the children to benefit from specialist intervention. MOEY should also supervise and monitor the work of the teachers, thus removing the responsibility from the DCS, while DCS, on the other hand, 
We provide the physical environment to facilitate teaching and learning. It may be easier to reintegrate the children into the public school system upon discharge from DCS as the teachers themselves could meet the recommendations to have them return, said the report. Crane operator loses appeal to clear name in gun possession case. A Kingston man placed on probation for a year for illegal possession of firearm is relieved that his ordeal took place before the amendment of the Firearm Act, which proposes a new mandatory minimum of 15 years imprisonment for illegal possession of firearm. When Albert Barton pointed to a sweetie pan in his room about 6.30 a.m. on July 3, 2013, and told the police that a man in his community named Seeks had just given him a gun to slash, he thought that he would have been at the end of his matter. The police had actually seen a man leave in Paulton's room and took him back to the room. On seeing Zeke's and the police, Paulton showed the police where the gun was hidden. Paulton was charged with illegal possession of the said firearm and illegal possession of ammunition. The case went to trial and Paulton was convicted in June 2018 of the charges. He was sentenced in September 2018 to 12 months probation for illegal possession of the firearm and two months probation for illegal possession of the ammunition. The judge did not send him to prison based on his antecedent and the social inquiry report. But Paulton, a 53-year-old businessman and crane operator of a Kingston 11 address, was far from happy with the outcome of his case. He appealed his conviction and last month, the Court of Appeal upheld the conviction and sentence. The gun has been the main weapon of choice for murderers across the island snuffing out the majority of the more than 1,400 lives taken last year and causing injury to hundreds more. Shootings are also prevalent, with more than 145 incidents recorded within the first 46 days of this year up to February 15. The Firearms Probation and Regulation Act, tabled earlier this month, is proposing that a person convicted of illegal possession of a firearm must serve at least 15 years in prison before becoming eligible for parole. The maximum penalty of life imprisonment remains. There is currently no minimum sentence for firearm possession, which means judges have to use their discretion consistent with the sentencing guidelines. National Security Minister Dr. Horace Chang said the government was anxious to enact the new law and deliverably under the Crime Oversight Monitoring Committee, which will first be reviewed by a joint selected committee. Opposition leader Mark Golden has also welcomed the introduction of the bill stating, as long as we are operating within the confines of our constitution, matters which are seriously affecting the safety of the nation must be met with a serious and appropriate and proportional response. Last week, Peter Champion, a QC, was instructed attorney at law, Samuel Campbell, in person's appeal, said that he agreed with the observation of the appellate court that Parsons' case represented a more unusual set of circumstances. It is proof of the fact that it is not in all cases involving illegal firearm that severe penalty is warranted, noted Champagny. He said Parsons' case demonstrates the reality that takes place in certain inner city communities where law abiding citizens are sometimes forced to hide guns for criminals and do so out of fear for their lives. He said that was the situation in Parsons' case. Champagne explained that the proposed legislation does not take into account transit possession, that is to say, where an illegal gun is forced on a law abiding citizen in circumstances where the possession of it is only a few seconds before the police intervene. The Social Enquiry report stated that Parsons was gainfully employed since he graduated from the Hill Selassie High School in Kingston, and the committee members were shocked to learn that he was charged with a criminal offense. Paulson had said in his defense that these had threatened to kill him if he did not follow his directives and lock the weapon. Several grounds of appeal were filed and it was also argued that the trial judge erred in her finding that the defense of the druggist was not raised sufficiently. Prosecutors Adley Duncan and Monique Scott submitted the convictions should not be overturned because the judge made a finding of fact which he was entitled to do. The prosecutor said custody and control for the short period can constitute possession. The court, in dismissing the appeal last month, said Ponson had failed to demonstrate that the judge erred in refusing his no case submission, rejecting the defense of the rest of circumstances, or assessing the evidence as to the elements of possession. 
the quoted part on sentences should be reckoned as having commenced on September 14, 2018. 47-year-old woman among five recorded COVID deaths, 94 new cases. The Ministry of Health and Wellness is reporting that 94 new COVID-19 cases were recorded over a 24-hour period up to Saturday afternoon. Five COVID-19 deaths that occurred from October 2021 to February 19 were also recorded on Saturday, bringing the overall coronavirus death toll in Jamaica to 2,784. A 47-year-old woman from St. Elizabeth is among the latest recorded COVID fatalities. The separate deaths of seven COVID-19 patients are under investigation by health authorities, while one death has been classified as being coincidental. There were 263 recoveries on the day, bringing that tally to 75,103. The newly confirmed COVID-19 cases brought the total number on record for the island to 127,610. Notably, the island recorded an 8.5% positivity rate based on the samples that were tested on Saturday. Of the newly confirmed cases, 50 are females and 44 are males, with ages ranging from 2 days to 95 years. The cases were recorded in Kingston and St. Andrew 24, St. James 18, St. Catherine 16, Westmoreland 11, Clarendon 5, Manchester 4, St. Anne 4, St. Elizabeth 4, Portland 3, Trelawney 2, Hanover 2, and St. Thomas 1. There are 46 moderately ill patients, 22 severely ill patients, and 4 critically ill patients among 1,157 active cases now under investigation in Jamaica. A total of 199 COVID-19 patients are now hospitalized locally. Please remember to subscribe, like, share, and click the notification bell for daily updates.